Nice to see a full house this cold winter evening. Good evening, I'm Gleaves Whitney, and I'm proud to serve as the director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University. And I always like to begin by thanking the people that need to be thanked for helping put an event on like this. I first of all want to reach out and thank the philosophy department here at Grand Valley, who've been uh, wonderfully cooperative partners to uh, bring about this event this evening. And I think many of the students here this evening are also philosophy students, am I correct? You can be bold, yes. Uh, all right, good. Let's hear it. I, I think this will set the record for students from a particular major who are here, so pat yourselves on the back. This is very good. I um, also want to thank our very generous donors who helped make an event like this possible, especially Colonel Ralph W. Hallenstein, who is 102 years young and sends his uh, regards to us this evening. Well, permit me to do something that I don't usually do to open a program, but it's useful every once in a while to restate what an institution's purpose is. And as this evening's program is the Hallenstein Center's first American Conversation of 2015, I would like to use the occasion briefly to restate what we are about. Again and again, I am approached by people who attend our talks and they say, we are sick and tired of what politics and public service have become. What's the Howenstein Center doing to overcome the ideological gridlock and dysfunction and cynicism and corruption that dominate the headlines? Aren't we better than that? Yes, we are better than that. As a student of American history, I believe to my core that we are better than today's sordid and discouraging headlines. I first remind people that we are West Michigan, where leaders like President Gerald Ford, Senator Arthur Vandenberg, uh, Congressman Paul Henry, knew how to work in democratic institutions where people with robust disagreements could still come together and work with each other to solve problems. I firmly believe that our best statesmen from the Midwest have a thing or two that we could teach people in New York City or Washington, D.C. or on the other coast. Second, I point to another West Michigander, our center's founding benefactor, Colonel Ralph W. Hallenstein, whose career exemplifies the ethical leadership and public service that we seek to inspire in Grand Valley students and in the Cook Leadership Academy Fellows. It's no exaggeration to say that Ralph inspires every initiative that we have here at the Hallenstein Center. Third, in 2012, with the help of an NEH grant, the Hallenstein Center launched the Common Ground Initiative to encourage the principled exploration of clashing policies and clanging philosophies. Our goal is not to turn Democrats into Republicans or Republicans into Democrats. Our goal is to raise up leaders who have the skill and understanding to find common ground for the common good. It is the only way democratic institutions can work in a sustainable fashion. Our Common Ground Initiative is premised on the idea that a free people always develop contending factions. And for simplicity, we can boil them down to the party of innovation and the party of conservation. American history mostly happens where these two parties collide and clash and then learn to compromise and accommodate each other before again colliding and clashing. It's an endless drama, as you know. I like to think of the relationship between these two opposing forces as part of a triptych. If you've been to an art museum, perhaps you've encountered a triptych, which is three panels of paintings. For our purposes, think of the left panel as the panel of innovation, the right panel as the party of conservation. To be sure, each of these panels has its own internal conflicts going on, but the main drama of American history takes place in that large center panel. That's where the action really is. Democrats versus Republicans. Progressives versus conservatives. North versus South. Federalists versus anti-federalists. There's always one group that wants to slow down the pace of change and conserve institutions, while another group wants to speed up the pace of change and get on with innovation and reform. The art of leadership in this environment the art of politics in our democracy 
is to find principled ways to leverage these clashing forces for the common good. The Howenstein Center seeks to understand this process of change, this leveraging both historically and in the 21st century. And we are not afraid to use the C word around here. We help people identify and achieve principled compromise. Our Common Ground Initiative is unique in higher education today. No other public university in the United States is making a balanced, comprehensive exploration of what it means to be progressive and what it means to be conservative in the 21st century. Our wheelhouse talks to inform leaders, our American conversations to engage citizens, and our coffee house debates to brief voters. All of these bring in experts who help us explore the principles of these two traditions and the possible common ground they might share historically, culturally, and politically. We do so in the conviction that academic rigor requires intellectual diversity. Our Common Ground Initiative seeks to create a space here on campus where conservatives and progressives can come together in an open, respectful, intellectually rigorous environment, a forum to confront the challenges we face. Ask us about our many exciting programs. We have a whole table full of literature out that I hope you'll avail yourselves of when you leave this evening. This evening's American Conversation invites us to consider the ancient but ever new debate over free will. Because if a free people do not have free will, if a free people are really not choosing how then they shall live together, what is the point of democracy? Our February 3rd event, we are hosting a coffee house debate in which two legal experts from Washington, D.C. are going to come here to this stage and discuss uh, the free speech and the nature of that famous Supreme Court decision, Citizens United. On April 2nd, we are hosting two people who could not be more different from one another. We're bringing in Cornell West and Robbie George from Princeton University. Both of them uh, will share with us how they became friends and developed a popular course that they team teach. Then on April 30th to May 1st, we are hosting a summit on the Midwest, a seemingly forgotten region, but one that in the long run will prove to be America's most common ground of all. Again, as I say, for most more details about these programs, please check out the literature in the back table outside this room and also go to our website at howensteincenter.org. Find out more about what we do. Get involved with the work, the valuable work that we do. Let me conclude by thanking you for all the ways you help and support us complete our mission here at the Howenstein Center at Grand Valley State University. Thank you. Well, it's now my honor to introduce to you a valued colleague at the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies, Joe Hogan. Joe? Thank you, Gleaves. <clears throat> As Gleaves said, we at the Howenstein Center, through our Common Ground Initiative, are pleased to host Dr. Alfred Mealy, the William H. and Lucille T. Workmeister Professor of Philosophy at Florida State University. Dr. Mealy is the preeminent public intellectual at the intersection of philosophy and neuroscience. He has in total received roughly $9 million in grant funding from the John Templeton Foundation for his work as director of the Big Questions and Free Will Project and the Philosophy and Science of Self-Control Project. He's authored nine books for Oxford University Press, edited numerous others. He's lectured in 22 countries. He's been featured on Big Think in the PBS series Closer to Truth. And rumor has it he's also coming to theaters near you Dr. Mealy will, we hear, be in a French fiction film about free will and quantum mechanics. <laughs> Today, he's come to talk with us about his recent book, Free, Why Science Hasn't Disproved Free Will, and its implications for the way we think about political decision making. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alfred Mealy.
So let's see if the microphone works. Does it work OK? Yeah? Good. Um, today I'm going to talk mainly about a series of neuroscience experiments which are often claimed to prove that we don't have free will. Um, what these experiments challenge, or at least these claims about the experiments, is a common presumption that we make about ourselves, and it's this one, basically, that we make uh, informed, conscious decisions on a pretty regular basis. Um, the data are claimed to show that we never make conscious decisions. Now, if we didn't make conscious decisions, just to get into politics a, a very little bit, um, elections wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> Why do we take people's votes seriously? Well, because we think they're informed and they're making conscious decisions to express their judgments and uh, preferences. And this is challenged, and so it's really quite uh, striking. Um, I'm going to start really with what got me interested in writing about this. I'd been tracking the, the science for a very long time. But there came a point when there were a lot of uh, news articles claiming that scientists had shown that people didn't have free will. And I wondered what effect that might have on people to read in the newspaper, say, or read online that you don't have free will. Um, and I thought, well, you know, people might be depressed by it, or people might think, uh, oh, I thought that all along. Or they might think, oh, what do scientists know, you know about free will? Um, so let me read you some of the news reports, then I'll talk about some uh, simple studies, and then we'll get to the neuroscience. I'll read you just two uh, quotations from news reports. The first one was from an April 2008 um, article in Science Now Daily News, quoting, your mind might be made up before you know it. Researchers have found patterns of brain activity that predict people's decisions up to 10 seconds before they're aware they've made a choice. The result was hard for some to stomach, because it suggested that the unconscious brain calls the shots, making free will an illusory afterthought. And the experiment that's being referenced there is one of the experiments I'll talk about. And then here's another one. This is from an article in Science News, uh, December 2008. It was called The Decider. And quoting, free will is not the defining feature of humanness, modern neuroscience implies but is rather an illusion that endures only because biochemical complexity conceals the mechanisms of decision making. Um, so I wondered how people would respond to claims like these. Now I got some anecdotal evidence relatively early on. I thought I would write uh, a book on this, a serious book for philosophers and scientists. Uh, the book has since been published. It's called Effective Intentions. It was published in 2009. And while I was writing it, I got this email out of the blue from somebody I don't know. And uh, I asked her actually for permission to use it in my preface. So it's in the preface, and I'll read it to you. This is the whole email. Dear Dr. Mealy, I recently purchased a DVD by Dr. Stephen Walensky. He explains from the point of view of neuroscience that there is no such thing as free will, as we can only perceive an action after it has already occurred. Can you please help me with this? I can understand that I don't know what thought will occur next, but that that has already happened is beyond comprehension. Thank you, as I am in a lot of despair." <laughs> and that is one predictable reaction to the, the news that you don't have free will. Uh, as I was writing that book, we started getting some hard evidence about what happens when you lower people's confidence in free will. Uh, the first bit of hard evidence was reported in a paper by Kathleen Voss and Jonathan Schooler. It was published in 2008. And what they did was to divide their subject pool into three groups. And uh, one group read passages saying that there was no free will, actual scientific passages saying that there's no free will. And another group read neutral passages. And uh, the third group read passages saying that there was free will. And then the next task was to take a little math quiz. And they were told that the programmers of the quiz screwed up so that if they didn't press the space bar right after the question showed up, then the answer would show up right on the scre uh, screen, in which case, of course, they could cheat. And the people who read the no free will passages cheated way more often than the other two groups. <laughs> the other two groups behaved about the same, which is evidence that free will is a sort of default assumption. It's an assumption most people make. 
Uh, they did a version of this in which people were paid a dollar for every correct answer. And so by cheating, you were stealing. And the people who read the no free will passages then stole more often. Uh, a friend of mine at Florida State University, Roy Baumeister, in our psychology department, decided to do a follow-up study. And um, he used just two groups. There was a group who read passages saying there's no free will, and a group who read neutral passages. And then their next task was to serve snacks to people who were about to walk into the room. And they were told two things about these people. They all have indicated that they really hate spicy food and they have to eat everything that you put on their plate. And the people who read the no free will passages doled out way more of the spicy salsa than the other group. So um, lowering confidence in free will actually increased aggressive behavior. And you might wonder, you know, what's going on there? Why would that happen? Well, you know, it turns out lots of people have somewhat aggressive urges. And then if you lower their confidence in free will, they might think, I don't have any free will. You can't blame me. I'll just go for it. Um, so we have hard evidence then that decreasing confidence in free will increases misbehavior. Uh, you don't want to do experiments where you're allowing people to do really bad things, but you know who knows what can happen. And um, the news that scientists have shown that there's no free will isn't true, as I'll explain, at least from the neuroscience angle. It would take another lecture or two to cover some other angles. And uh, so it's somewhat dangerous. We have evidence for that, and it isn't true. And so I think there's reason to you know, talk about it uh, and write about it. After I wrote that book, Effective Intentions, I thought eventually, well, now I need to um, explain it to students, because that's a pretty hard, hard book, although smart students can read it. So I wrote a dialogue on free will and science uh, for students. And then I wrote this uh, book, Free, that was mentioned. Uh, and I wrote it for my dad, actually. My dad's 90. He's a retired mailman. He never went to college, and he always complained he couldn't understand any of my books. And I thought, Dad, I'm going to write a book for you. And he understands it. We talked about it on the phone. I gave him a little quiz, and, and I know he understands it. Um, so I'm going to give you, that's how I got interested in writing about this topic. I'm going to give you just a little bit of terminology and then, uh, then we'll get into the experiments. And um, I always have to remind myself consciously which lecture I'm giving because I do it in different ways and talk about different experiments. And notice that I'm doing this consciously. You can tell I am because you hear me say it. And this conscious talking to myself actually guides my presentation. So this is evidence that consciousness makes a difference. Um, so a bit of terminology. Deciding we should just think of as, that is, deciding to do something, just a momentary mental action of forming an intention to do a thing. So I might decide now to snap my fingers now. And the deciding is, is an internal thing. It's a mental thing. And it's a little action of forming an intention to snap my fingers now. Intention, you can just understand however you like. It turns out most people are pretty much in agreement about what it is to intend to do something. And then among decisions and intentions, we have proximal ones and distal ones. And a proximal decision is a decision you make now to do something now, like a decision you make now to snap your fingers now. And a distal decision is a decision you make now to do something later, like I might decide now because I'm thinking about beer. I, for, I didn't have any alcohol before this talk so that I could be somewhat lucid. So I might decide now to ask Joe to buy me a beer after the talk, say. And that would be a distal decision. All of these neuroscience experiments that I'll be talking about, and all of the neuroscience experiments on free will, actually, are only about proximal intentions and decisions. Intentions and decisions to do things now. Um, now, before I get to the actual experiments, uh, I want to read you some quotations from uh, articles in which the experiments were uh, reported, articles by the scientists who did the experiments. <clears throat> the first one here is from Benjamin Libet, and it's actually Libet's work on free will that got the anti-free will ball, ball rolling in um, neuroscience. It was originally done in the early 80s, and it persisted uh, for quite some time. And work like this is still being done now, in fact, uh, I funded some with money from the Big Questions and Free Will Grant to get more evidence about what's going on. So anyway, this is on your handout. 
The brain decides to initiate or at least prepare to initiate certain actions before there is any reportable subject of awareness that such a decision has taken place. So the idea is the brain is making decisions unconsciously before you're aware the decision has been made. Um, next, because brain activity in the supplementary motor area consistently preceded the conscious decision, it has been argued that the brain had already unconsciously made a decision to move even before the subject became aware of it. And this is from a paper in which they tried to do better than Libet, and I'll talk about uh, that paper too. Third, this is the connection to free will now, if the act now process is initiated unconsciously, then conscious free will is not doing it. So the claim there is that if you make your decisions unconsciously, then free will is not involved in the production of those decisions, nor in the actions that the decisions lead to. And then finally, there's a generalization claim. Our overall findings do suggest some fundamental characteristics of the simpler acts that may be applicable to all consciously intended acts and even to responsibility and free will. So the claim there is uh, people don't decide consciously in this experimental situation, and we can generalize this to all cases so people never decide consciously. All of your decisions, if you make them, you make unconsciously. So, <clears throat> so that you can see what's going on, I'm going to describe the experiment that generates these results, the original experiment. And this is done with EEG, where you take readings of electrical conductivity from the scalp. And then I'll talk about a study done with uh, fMRI, where you measure changes in blood flow in the brain. It's a slower technology, but it's uh, more accurate in a way. And then I'll talk about an experiment done with uh, depth electrodes on epilepsy patients who are being prepared for surgery. Sometimes epilepsy isn't treatable uh, by drugs, and uh, people will opt for surgery. Part of the skull is removed uh, so that the physicians can figure out where to do the cutting uh, to reduce the epilepsy. And if uh, the patients like, they can take part in science experiments. We put electrode grids right on the brain. We take readings directly from the brain, and we see what's going on. Uh, oop, when they make decisions. And I actually funded uh, a project like that, too. It was a fascinating project. So I'm going to talk about those three, but I'll start with uh, the Libet thing, using EEG. So the subject's task is to flex his wrist whenever he wants, and he's going to do this 40 times over the course of almost two hours. Um, and Readings, EEG readings, are taken from the scalp, so you can see what's going on. You have to average over 40 trials to get results you can use. And after the subject flexes, he's supposed to report where the spot was on a very fast clock. These days we use a hand. It makes a complete revolution in about two and a half seconds. When he first became aware of his decision or intention or urge or wish or will to flex his wrist right then. So this would be like a proximal intention. And... Uh, they take readings from the wrist muscle so they can see when the hand starts moving. So the idea is you watch the clock, you flex whenever you want, after you flex, a little while after, the clock's going to stop, and then what you do these days is you have a cursor and you move it to the point on the clock where you think it was when you first felt your intention or urge or whatever, when you became aware of it. And what he discovered is that when subjects were regularly reminded to be spontaneous, that is not to think in advance about when to do it, just to do it in a spontaneous way, um, he got an EEG ramp up that started about 550 milliseconds before the muscle began to move. So that's a little more than half a second before the muscle began to move. But the average time of first reported awareness of the urge or whatever was, uh, was 206, so we usually round it to 200. It was about 200 milliseconds, two-tenths of a second before the muscle moved. And so what Libet said is, look what's going on is the decision to flex now is made here, and the person doesn't become conscious of it for about another third of a second. So it's an unconscious decision, and because it's unconscious, it's not free. And then he says, all decisions are like this. Now, um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about consciousness here and a certain wrinkle in Libet's view, and then we'll move on uh, to another experiment. 
And I'll describe, this is where I remind myself too, so I stick to the plan. I'll describe all three of the experiments I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, and then I'll go through some problems with them, one at a time, but each problem that I talk about will apply to all three. Um, okay, so Libet thought that although there's no free will, there was a free kind of veto power. He thought that once you became aware of your urge or intention or whatever it is to do a thing right away, uh, you had time to cancel it or veto it. And actually, um, the way he thought about it is, so you become conscious of the urge here, and you're going to have a little window, about a tenth of a second really, to veto it, because if you don't cancel it by then, you're going to hit the point of no return and you'll have a process that can't be stopped. So he put the point of no return about a tenth of a second before uh, the muscle burst. Uh, muscle burst is what we call the beginning of measurable muscle motion from the wrist. Um, and Libet said he had two kinds of evidence of veto power. Uh, one, there were report subjects made after the experiment that from time to time they had urges to flex right away and they didn't act on them, they just overrode them or vetoed them and waited for another one and then acted on that. Um, but he also did what he thought of as a veto study, a controlled study. And uh, it, he thought, generated evidence that we actually do have this veto power. Now it turns out most of the neuroscientists, almost all, who follow Libet will follow him all the way up to the veto and then they deny that there's veto power. But let me explain to you his veto experiment and then I'll move on. So what he did was to tell subjects to prepare to flex their wrist when the hand hit a certain point on the clock, but then not to do it. So imagine that you pick the nine o'clock point and you say, prepare to flex when the spot hits there. And it's gonna hit there you know, pretty soon because the clock is fast, two and a half seconds, it's all the way around, uh, but don't do it. And when he gave subjects that instruction, what he got was an EEG reading that looks sort of like this. It started ramping up about a second before the designated time, like the nine o'clock point. Um, and then about 150 to 250 milliseconds before that time, it started to peter out. And Libet said, well, look at that. I have found evidence of veto power. These people intended back here to flex their wrist when the spot hit the nine o'clock point. Uh, and they didn't do it, so they vetoed an intention. Now, there's a problem with this experiment uh, that I could try to demonstrate in a fancy way, but there's a really simple way to do it. And the way to do it is we do our own experiment for free right now. So let's try it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count one, two, three. And what I want you to do is to prepare to snap your fingers like this when I get to three, but don't do it. So just prepare to do it, but don't do it. And I want you to sort of be introspective and look into your minds and see what's going on while I'm counting to three, okay? Can we do it? So now we're gonna prepare to do it. And I can always tell when people aren't preparing because they don't have their fingers together. <laughs> it's a dead giveaway. Okay, so we're gonna prepare to do it, but we're not gonna do it. One, two, three. Okay, nobody did it. Now what does that mean? Nobody intended to snap their fingers when I got to three. What they intended to do was to prepare to do it and not to do it, and that's exactly what they did, right? And the same thing is going on in Libet's veto experiment. These people did not intend to flex their wrists when the spot hit a certain point. They intended to prepare to do it and not to do it. But notice what happens, the preparation to do it which is sort of thinking about doing it and realizing that that time is coming up and tracking the clock, the preparation to do it generated an EEG reading, a relatively consistent reading, well, that you get by averaging anyway. And what that should make you wonder is what's driving the EEG reading in the case in which you go through and flex? Is it an intention to flex way back then or is it something else? Okay, so now we're sort of in the ballpark where we can Oh, no, we can't, because I remembered my plan. I'll, I'll do the critique after I describe the other two experiments. It is so tempting. 
uh, after you describe an experiment to do the critique right away. And uh, you have to remind yourself consciously, in my case, um, not to do that. And then it all works out. You get on to the next experiment. So I'll come back to that shortly. I'm sticking to the plan. Um, so the next experiment I'm going to talk about was done with uh, fMRI. And again, what you do with fMRI is you measure changes in blood flow in the brain. This is kind of a slow process. Uh, it takes about three or four seconds for blood to replenish the area where it was most used. But in this way, you can tell what parts of the brain are, are most active at a given time. Now, in this fMRI study that I'm going to talk about, what the subjects were supposed to do was to press either the button on the left or the button on the right. And there was nothing that, that would hang on which button they pressed. It was just an arbitrary choice, the one on the left or the one on the right. And they had to do this many times. You know, they, they do it, you take readings, they do it again. They had to do it many times, and they had to try to avoid falling into any patterns. So they were supposed to be as random as they could and not think in advance about which button to press. And uh, the scientists claim, this is a quotation, that they were able to predict with high accuracy, seven to 10 seconds in advance, which button the person would press next. And so <clears throat> the inference they made was, look, these people had already decided seven to 10 seconds in advance which button they were going to press, but they weren't aware of these decisions at all. The people thought uh, you know, they weren't making decisions in advance. They were making them just before they pressed. OK? All right, so that's the second one. I'll, I'll discuss problems with that one, too. And then um, the third one is a study done with depth electrodes. And I mentioned the epilepsy background, the electrode grids right on the brain, taking readings directly from the brain. This is about as accurate you can, as you can get with uh, neuroscience, because now there's nothing in between the brain and your electrodes. Right? You're measuring directly from it. And um, in this study, what subjects were supposed to do this? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. So I was on the, the depth electrode thing. Now I'm going to forget eventually to keep this close to my mouth. That's why I was doing the other microphone. But you can remind me. I don't want to remind myself about everything. I have to think about the talk. Um, so the task was to click a mouse button. And uh, after a lot of measuring, the scientists were able to predict with 80% accuracy within about a 300 millisecond window, 900 milliseconds in advance, when they would press the key. Now this is pretty impressive. It's 80% accuracy, and they're not predicting exactly when the key will be pressed, but within a window of 300 milliseconds, they're predicting when the window will be pressed. Now the scientists who did this work <clears throat> didn't make any claims about free will, at least not in the papers uh, published about this work. But when journalists got a hold of it, they said, oh my goodness, now we've got 80% accuracy. They're making these predictions based just on information from the brain, and so there's no free will. OK, so now I've described the three experiments, and now I can get to uh, the critique. And there are three, well, there are more than three problems. These are the three I'm going to talk about today. And each of the three problems applies to all three of the experiments, which is, which is really handy because it makes the talk uh, shorter than it would otherwise be. Um, so our first question is, what happens at 550 milliseconds in Libet's study? Now Libet says, remember that what happens here is the person decides right then to flex his wrist right then, and then it takes uh, about half a second for the muscle to start moving because this is a proximal decision. So one thing we'd want to know is how long does it take 
a proximal decision or a proximal intention, say an intention to do something right now, to generate muscle motion. And it's actually going to take longer if it's going to the foot than the hand, so we want to know about the hand. Um, and um, so what I did back then, because that was uh, before I had grant money, so I couldn't pay people to do experiments, and I'm a philosopher. Philosophers don't have labs, so I don't have any place to go and, and do my own experiment, was to um, look around for independent evidence on this question, how long it takes an intention to do a thing now to generate muscle motion. And what I wanted to find, really, was also a study in which the subjects are watching a fast clock, because watching a clock is going to attract some attention, and then there's got to be some attention devoted to the other task. And what I found was a go signal a reaction time study in which the subjects were watching a clock. Now, in go signal reaction time studies, you have a pre-designated task, like it might be to click a mouse button or flex your wrist, and you're supposed to do it as soon as you can after you get the go signal, and you know what the go signal is. Often it's a tone, sometimes it's a flash of a light. And there's going to be a warning signal saying, get ready, there's going to be a go signal pretty soon, and then you get the go signal and you know what you're supposed to do. Now, if the way that process works is like this, when you get the go signal, that generates an intention to do the thing now, conscious or otherwise, it's not going to matter, that generates an intention to do the thing now, and then that intention plays a role and triggers the behavior. Uh, then we get evidence from these studies about how long it takes an intention to do a thing now to generate muscle motion, and I was especially interested in hands, so in hands. Uh, so I found a study like that, and the average time between the sounding of the go signal and the muscle motion was 231 milliseconds. So now it takes time to detect the signal, and it's going to take a little time because it's a causal process for the detection to generate this intention to do it now. So the time between intention acquisition, the intention coming into being, and the beginning of the muscle motion is going to be less than 231 milliseconds. It's going to be around 200, which is interesting. And I don't want to put much weight on that time. What I do want to put the weight on is the fact that we're now less than half of this figure, and that should lead us to think that maybe it's not a decision that's present yet, but something else, maybe part of a process that may eventually lead to a decision. And I made a note to myself to talk about a more uh, recent study. It's not a reaction time study. It's a decide signal study. Uh, and this was a, a study of a kind that I suggested should be done uh, back in my book, Effective Intentions. Um, in this study, subjects are supposed to press either the left button or the right button, and it's up to them. And they're not supposed to make a decision about which button to press right then until they get a signal that means make your decision now. Okay, now what you can do uh, in an experiment like this is you can check the EEG to look for differences before the decide signal comes, before that tone. And what they discovered is that there was no pre-tone difference in the EEG, which is evidence that nobody decided before they heard the decide signal. And the average time between the sounding of the decide signal and the beginning of muscle motion was 150 milliseconds. So that the time between an actual decision and the beginning of muscle motion is less than 150 milliseconds. And so, again, we're around here. Okay? So we have evidence, we have hard evidence that the decisions to do things now aren't made this early, and they are made uh, pretty close to these W times. But if they're made pretty close to the W times, then they look like they're being made consciously, and then this particular threat to free will goes away. Okay? Now, let's go to the fMRI experiment. So they say that, so we'd be way off the map now, we'd be way over here. Seven to ten seconds in advance, people have already made their decisions. And remember, they claimed that uh, they could predict the decisions uh, with high accuracy, seven to ten seconds in advance. But it, the high accuracy here, here turns out to be 60%. So they had a 60% success rate at predictions. 
And just to illustrate, I mean, that's statistically significant, no doubt. But to illustrate, with a fair coin, I can predict with 50% accuracy which of two buttons a person's going to press next, you know, just by flipping it and assigning heads to this one and tails to that one. And I can do it way more than 7 to 10 seconds in advance if the person will promise not to flex for, I mean, press for a minute or two. Then I can do it a minute or two in advance. I can do it for free and come within 10 points of them. So the 60% accuracy rate is, is not a great rate. And probably what they're predicting, what they're latching on to, is uh, a certain kind of sort of bias. We think of it in neuroscience, we call it a bias. It's sort of a, an unconscious leaning in one direction or the other, like toward this button or toward that button. And what would generate the bias? Well, they know what their task is. They're trying to keep track. And that's going to change the probability on the next press of which way they're going to go. So it's just a sort of unconscious nudge. But unconscious nudges really are not problems for free will because we can act against them. And if the success rate's only 60%, it looks like fairly often the people are not going in the predicted direction. Um, same thing uh, with, the, uh, with the depth electrode study. I think that what's going on there is that they're picking up on part of a causal process, a process in the brain, that uh, is raising the probability as it goes along that the person will decide soon to click the mouse button. But it's just raising the probability. It's not actually settling on things. And that's part of the reason that we're not ever getting higher than 80%. It's not just that the technology isn't perfect. It's also that it's still open what the person will decide at that point in time. And again, it's 80% within a 300 millisecond window, so it's not pinpointing the time. Uh, OK, so that's one problem. The way to think about the problem is they're claiming the decisions are made back here or earlier, and our evidence is pointing much more strongly to the proposition that the decisions are being made around here, and that's within the window of the awareness time. Uh, that was the first problem. Now, we go to the second problem. This is, about, this is about the point of no return. So people have heard me make that first point. And what they sometimes say is, oh, you know, maybe you're right, and the decision really isn't made as early as we think, and it's, it's made later. But even so, they say, the point of no return is hit at these early times. So in Libet's study, it's hit over half a second before the muscle starts moving. And in some of the other studies, it's hit even earlier. Now, the point of no return of a process is a point such that when you reach it, you cannot stop the process. So when you reach it, the process has to go through. There's no way to stop it. It's like when you kick your leg up, there's a certain point at which the quadriceps muscle just flings your leg up, and you can't stop it from going up. Uh, and they're saying, well, look, this is what's going on in the brain, something like that. So th that's a question now. Has the point of no return been hit early? And let's take um, Libet's time, because his 550 milliseconds is closer to the time of the muscle burst than either of the other two figures. So is the point of no return hit here at minus 550? Or we could ask, um, we could pick a, se pick a segment of the time, like a 300 millisecond segment, and ask whether uh, the point of no return is hit anywhere uh, during that process. Now, if you want to answer that question, what you have to do, for, do is look for cases in which you get a signal that looks like this, but no muscle motion. I mean, that's the way to do the test. You look for a signal that looks like this. You see whether it ever happens that you get no muscle motion. And if you can do that test and you see that time after time, whenever you get a signal like that, you do get muscle motion. Uh, then you have some strong evidence. But did Libet have evidence like that? No, and here's why. To do the EEG experiments, you have to do something called back averaging. And what back averaging involves is that your computer gets a signal from something to make a record of the preceding second or so of brain activity. So there's some little signal goes to the computer and says, okay, record that, 
And a way to think about this is a kind of simple way is you get like a little reading, then you're going to get another one later on a separate trial, and you just sort of superimpose them over each other. You filter out noise, and you get a curve like this that you can see. Um, Libet's trigger for the back averaging was the muscle motion. So it was the detection of the muscle motion that told the computer to make a record of the preceding second of brain activity. But if you're using the muscle motion as your trigger, then you can't test for cases in which you get a signal of the kind I described, but no muscle motion, because none of those show up. None of those are recorded. So Libet certainly hasn't uh, provided evidence that the point of no return is hit here. Uh, and in the other studies, you don't get evidence that the point of no return is hit even earlier. All you get are probabilities, uh, and not very high ones at that. Now, if we were doing an experiment in which I see you get a go signal, and I know what you're supposed to do when, when you get that go signal with your right hand, say, and we're taking EEG readings from my head, you would get a graph that looks a little bit like this from me, and I have no intention at all of moving, and I don't move. So that's evidence that what these curves are indicating isn't really an intention or a decision to do a thing. It's some kind of thinking about doing a thing or realizing that the thing is going to be done pretty soon. There are mirror neurons that work both when you're about to do a thing and when you see somebody else about to do that thing. It's the same neurons that are firing. And so even observing somebody else will generate readings like this, which is more evidence that this is not a decision that's made, but it's something else. It's part of a preparatory process. OK. Um, that's good. So now we go to problem three. So now I'm, I've argued to, to you that nobody has shown that these decisions or intentions are made unconsciously. But let's suppose now that they are. So that, we're going to do that for the third problem. Suppose that all of our proximal decisions and intentions are made uh, unconsciously in these experiments, in experiments like this. Um, what could we infer from that about free will? And uh, that's right. I wanted to tell you about my experience as a subject, so that'll help shed light on this. Uh, let me see if I missed anything. Nope. That'll be good. I just want you to recall that Libet did generalize from his findings to all cases. And this is normal in the neuroscience literature. So years ago, I'll bet you it was probably 10 years ago by now, maybe longer, I was invited to give a lecture on neuroscience and free will at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, it was a motor control unit, uh, really uh, top-rate neuroscientists. And the plan was I would give my lecture and then after the lecture, I would be a subject in their experiment. It was a Libet experiment. And then uh, after that, they would take me out to dinner. <laughs> so I wanted to be a good, naive subject. And my plan was, I'll go sit in that chair. They'll wire me up. And I'll wait for urges to flex right away to appear. And I'll be watching that clock. And I'll be ready to report on where the spot, it was a hand, I guess, in that one, where the hand was on it when I made my decision to flex right then. So that was the plan. I sat in the chair, and I noticed nothing was happening. That is, no urges were coming to mind, no intentions, no decisions to flex. And I had two questions for myself. One was, how do people do this? You know, the other subjects, how do they do it? And uh, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Because, well, there were two reasons, really. I didn't want to look like a jerk, like I was being uncooperative and not doing anything. But I was also really getting hungry. You know, I'd been talking for a long time. And so um, what I decided to do is I would say now, silently to myself, and treat that as an expression of a decision to do it now. And I noticed that I was in the, the kind of situation I'm in when I go grocery shopping, say, and I have a 16-ounce jar of planter's peanuts on my list, and I go to the planter's peanuts display, and I just pick one. You know, I never think about this one or that one. They're all the same. I, I just pick one. Um, so I was in that kind of situation, um, but I had to report. I had to make this consciousness report, so I had to be aware of the picking. Okay, so I randomly picked. 
I don't, I don't know why I said now to myself exactly when I did as opposed to a few milliseconds later or earlier, but I did, and then I uh, reported it later. Now, by the way, I'm not going to criticize the reporting thing. I, I do that in some other places, but this is a really tricky task, uh, matching up your perception of a spot on a fast-moving clock with your perception of an internal event, like even silently saying now to yourself, which is way simpler than you know, deciding or intending. There you don't even maybe have a really good sense of what that feels like, whereas saying now to yourself silently feels just like saying it out loud, except there's no noise. You know, it's, it's just like that. So that's a tricky task. Um, and I was able to narrow it down to maybe 20% of the clock when I thought I said now to myself and I picked it. But the main point is, that what I'm doing here is just randomly picking a moment to begin flexing. And in those button experiments, they're randomly picking either this button or that bu button. Nothing hangs on it. In all these experiments, the subjects are not supposed to think in advance about when to do it. They're not supposed to do any planning about it. So conscious thinking about what to do is ruled out by the experimental conditions. And when you rule it out, Maybe it's not so surprising that uh, people aren't conscious of the process that leads up to their decision. Now, uh, point about free will, and then I'll get back to that. So th there are many disputes about free will in philosophy. I mean, anything you can argue about, and even some things you shouldn't be able to, uh, philosophers will argue about. I know that for sure. And one is um, about the domain of free action. So there's a view called restrictivism. And according to the restrictivists, the only place where you can have free action is where you have an internal struggle between, for example, your moral beliefs on the one hand and your urges on the other hand, or your uh, long-term self-interest on the one hand and short-term self-interest on the other hand. Um, and so they would say, well, there's no internal struggle in these cases, so these studies are not even studies about free will. Um, but suppose you, you don't like restrictivism and you think free will has, a, at least in principle, a much broader scope, which a lot of philosophers do. Even then, you're going to make a distinction between uh, random picking of a thing to do, like this millisecond rather than that, or this button rather than that, and decisions uh, that follow serious reasoning about what to do. And those decisions are so different that it's really hard to generalize from findings about one kind, like the random picking kind, to all of them. Uh, so think about you know, some of the things you've decided uh, after a long internal process. You know, a process that goes on for part of a day and then you stop and you come back to it the next day and you stop and come back to it the next day. Like it might be uh, for people who aren't so young, um, is it finally time to get the divorce? You might think about that for months, you know, and, and then you, uh, you come to a decision or maybe you've been accepted into some nice uh, grad programs and, and you have to think about uh, which one to go to. Um, or even sometimes, you know, selling your house or shall I buy this house? These are things people think a lot about. And uh, that really is nothing like just randomly picking a moment to begin flexing. And so they're not in a position to generalize from their findings about these particular cases to all cases. And th they should know uh, that they're not. Um, OK. So we have three conclusions now. Um, their findings don't show that even in these very experiments, decisions are made unconsciously. The better evidence points to the claim that the decisions are made uh, around the awareness time, you know, much closer to the time of action than these scientists are saying. They haven't shown that the point of no return is hit early either, so that process could still be open-ended, could still be running, and may or may not lead to a certain conclusion at a certain time, uh, very close to the time of action. Maybe Libet was right. Maybe it's about a tenth of a second. Uh, before the action that the point of no return is hit. And even if they had shown that decisions are made unconsciously in these particular experiments, they would not be entitled to generalize to all decisions. And so this argument for the non-existence of free will uh, fails across the board on these counts. 
Okay, and that's the end. Now, how do you want to do the Q&A? Do you want to call on people? So, yeah, I think what we'll do, uh, Professor, is we have these two mics up here, and if you have any questions, feel free to just come down the aisle either to me or Dana, and we can just field your questions one by one. Nobody wants to be first. You have to make random decisions now. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Wait, I'll pick. No, you. Hi. Hi, I, um, I wonder uh, if, if these, uh, what we should take uh, from your conclusion, is it that therefore we have free will, or is it just simply that we haven't shown we don't have free will. And uh, I mean, could, do you think better experiments could be done to make that decision? And, uh, um, uh, or, 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 and do, both, do sides differ on, on what the answer to that is, whether there's better tests? Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, so the conclusion of you know, the talk I just gave is a, a negative conclusion, conclusion. It's they haven't closed the door on free will. It's still open. Um, and notice I was able to do it without even talking about what free will is because their road to the claim that there's no free will goes through the claim that we make all of our decisions unconsciously. And what I was able to show is that they haven't demonstrated that. Um, that will be a very hard thing to demonstrate, that all decisions are made unconsciously. And um, notice, I mean, it's a point I made, but it's worth emphasizing that conscious thinking about what to do is shoved aside in these experiments. The subjects are told not to do it. Um, what about when subjects are consciously thinking about what to do? Uh, it's much more likely than that the probability of their consciously deciding goes up. And um, so could better experiments show it? I don't know. I, you know, I tried for four years uh, with really top-notch teams uh, generating evidence one way or the other. It looks like the stuff I've been criticizing uh, should be criticized even further. I mean, there are other problems with it. Um, but in, in the end, if you start asking this kind of question, you, you've got to ask, so what is free will anyway? And then once you think about that, you might think more about how to test it. And that's something um, I don't try to settle for people. I don't try to settle for them exactly what free will means. But I do give them options. And so it's probably time to do that, and then we can think about evidence. So I'll, I'll do it. These three options are, are in that book, uh, Free. So here's one way to think about free will. Oh, yeah, we'll do the gas station thing. Um, so years ago, I thought of this uh, gas station analogy. So at normal gas stations, you can get regular gas or mid-grade gas or premium gas. And so you can think of free will on that model. You can have sort of regular free will, you can have mid-grade free will, and you can have premium. And um, this would be enough to have regular free will, that you're sane and rational, you're well-informed, nobody's coercing you, nobody's holding a gun to your head, uh, you're not being seriously deceived, and you make a decision on the basis of good information. That would be enough to have free will. And we have tons of evidence that that happens. You know, it doesn't happen in every decision you make, but it happens in a lot of decisions. Now, some people will say uh, that's not enough for free will. You need more than that. What you need is a certain kind of openness. I used to have a simple way of uh, explaining this openness, but then the movie guy, the French filmmaker uh, that Joe mentioned, uh, gave me a much better story. It just takes a little long to tell, though, but he's a movie guy, so he's better at stories. So here's the story. This story illustrates what you need. So there's a guy named John. I have to keep this guy's name straight. There's a guy named John who is engaged to be married tonight. He's supposed to get married tonight. And he's feeling a little bit uneasy about the marriage. He's not really sure he should go through with it. And uh, then, in the morning, he gets a text from his former girlfriend. And it says, don't marry her. Run away with me. 
meet me at the airport tonight at 7, and let's go. And um, so John decides that he'd better make his decision on this by 6 o'clock. You know, is he going <laughs> to go through with the wedding, or is he going to run off with this woman who used to be his girlfriend? And it's that he still loves this old girlfriend that is partly making him uneasy about his decision. So he's got to decide by six so that if he decides to go to the wedding, you know, he can get there by seven, have his tux on and so on. And, and if not, well, then so he can get to the airport by seven and, and uh, meet the girl. So he thinks about it really hard. And in the end, right at six o'clock, he decides to go through with the wedding and have it and never mention a word to anyone. Now, in order for that decision to be uh, free on this second, this mid-grade way of thinking about free will, it has to be that if you rolled back time a little bit and then rolled it forward again without changing anything all the way up until the moment he makes his decision, it could happen that he makes a different decision. So that the one way to think about it, now it gets a little more technical, but so that the laws that govern decision-making are probabilistic or statistical. They're not exceptionless. And now, you know, you can't roll back time in real life, but in a movie, you can just do one of those little rewind things and go zip, and then uh, you have it roll forward and you see everything going the same way. John's thinking going the same way, but at six o'clock he decides, nope, I'm running off with this old girlfriend and, you know, to hell with the marriage. Um, so yeah, free will would require that, and we call this indeterminism, it's internal indeterminism, it's, uh, it's the absence of determinism, right in the brain, right at the time of decision. Um, and then the third kind of free will adds even more uh, to that, and it adds a, a spiritual or supernatural dimension. So you, you could think of it in terms of souls uh, that aren't bound by laws of nature, say. Uh, okay, so now we have these three options, and you know they're all significantly different from one another. Uh, the first one, there's a ton of evidence that we have free will. If you define it like that, we've got it. Right? There, we shouldn't even argue about that. Um, the second one, having good evidence about it would require that we understand enough about how the brain works to know one way or the other whether uh, different decisions are open, in some cases, right up to the moment of decision, and we don't know enough about the brain yet. We don't have the technology now. I think, you know, maybe someday we will, but it'll be long after I'm gone. I'll never know. And uh, I don't know, how do you study souls, right? So the third one I just stay clear of, and I deal with the first two. The first one we have, the second one, it's still wide open. There's no good evidence that we don't. Okay. Uh, actually, you answered my first question Oh, okay. uh, just previously, and that was kind of about uh, uh, the the future of neuroscience, and is is are the arguments going to be more difficult to uh, to argue against uh, as technology and uh, discoveries are being made? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you already kind of went through that. My second one, though, was about um, uh, here you discussed uh, neuroscience, but also psychology. I know was um, in in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and if you see a stronger case uh, in psychology being an answer against, uh, against free will, uh, and if either of those you see one being a, a, a having more potential to have better arguments uh, in the future. Okay, yeah, that, that's good. Um, I mean, that's an especially good question for people who have read the book because in the book, this neuroscientific attack on uh, free will is, is one thing I discussed, but I also discuss a kind of attack that comes from uh, situationist literature in social psychology. Now, actually, for those who haven't read the book, to give you a sense of it, I would need to describe some of those experiments. Let's see, if I did just one, what would it be? Okay. So we'll do um, a bystander experiment. So in this, well, this is what motivated the bystander, the original bystander study. And these have been done again and again. But it was uh, 50 years ago last year that Kitty Genovese was killed in New York City. And according to the news reports, um, lots of people witnessed the attack from their apartment windows and nobody called the police. That's what the news reports said. That is disputed, 
But it seems like there were a lot of people who witnessed it and didn't call the police. And, you know, people wondered why. How could you be so heartless or cold or whatever? Why not just call the police? It's an easy thing to do. So uh, some psychologists started doing studies on the bystander effect. And here's one. In this study, it was done with college students. A lot of these studies are done with college students, of course, because they take psychology classes and then they can get credit or however you work it out. You have to go through ethics boards. It's all, it's all above board for sure. But, um, but they're, you know, a handy group of subjects. So they thought what they were going to be doing is talking to one another while sitting in different rooms over microphones about college life. And... Um, Actually, they were being tested one at a time. And some of them thought that there were two other people that could hear them. Uh, some of them thought that there was just one other person who could hear them, and some thought that there were four, as I recall. I think those numbers are right. Um, and what they heard was a tape-recorded voice of somebody saying that he was having a lot of trouble. He thought he was going to have a seizure. He was losing it. He needed help, and it went on for a little over two minutes, just a few seconds over two minutes. When subjects thought that only they could hear the voice, you know, that he was the only guy around in this experiment, um, a huge percentage of them left the room basically right away, went out and got the experimenter uh, to come in and help. And of course, you know, they discovered there was just a tape recorder there. I mean, no, no helping. But the more people they thought were around, the less likely they were to help. So the helping behavior went way down, uh, depending on how many people you thought were around. So, and it's not as though believing that other people are around to help is a reason for you not to help. And still, it had an effect on their behavior. Now, there's study after study like this in different domains. There's Stanley Milgram's famous experiment about fake electrical shocks that you know, probably almost all of you know about, and others. And these experiments provide a lot of evidence that uh, factors in our situations have a huge effect on our behavior, even though we think they have no effect at all. So if you were to ask the subjects, why didn't they help, they wouldn't say, oh, I thought three other people heard the voice. You know, they'd come up with some other reason. Study after study like this. Now, these studies do indicate, I think, that maybe uh, we're not as free as we think we are, that we're more driven by situations than we think we are. But I don't think there are serious threats to free will, and for a couple of reasons. One is that you always get a significant percentage of people doing the right thing. And if you think that the people who are doing the wrong thing aren't acting freely, well, then you should think, well, what about the people who do the right thing? It's always a substantial percentage. Also, I think, and this is something I would like to test, and something I can test with this new uh, self-control grant money, I think that just educating people about these effects would improve behavior. And there is a way to test it. So, what you, so we already have the, the base rate data. We already know what happens in these experiments you know, in the past. So suppose we um, had a bunch of students come in and we told them about the experiments. We told them we were worried about free will and so on. And then we say, and look, you have to come back in uh, a week or 10 days to finish the interview. And then what we do is we stage a bystander event on the path to the building where they're going to do the interview. And we see whether their behavior is like the normal behavior in these experiments or better. It's a simple experiment to do. Uh, if we do it, it if, I get to, if I talk somebody into doing it, that's the way it's going to work, um, then we'll have evidence about whether education can reduce the bystander effect. And if it can, that's evidence of control that we have over our behavior, because by learning like this, we can improve our behavior. Um, I probably shouldn't go on too much about it, because really, in this domain, like the neuroscience domain, you have to look at study after study, one at a time, and, and see what they show. I have a question on the... Uh, the seven to ten second study where people got sixty percent. Yeah. Right. Are those are those studies widely replicated? I mean, you might think some people are really good at sort of reading people and 
guessing, maybe the two people who did it originally, and are they replicated on other conditions? Could you think if it were repeated over and over and you got 60% or 70% under other conditions by different people, maybe you maybe have something there. I just wondered what's, what's going on with those. Yeah, well the same lab, the, the same lab has done replications. They get similar results. What they do, I mean, you can do fMRI looking at the whole brain. So they look at the whole brain first, and then they see which regions of the brain have, are producing data that are most tightly correlated to the result. And they actually pick two regions. In the end, they pick two regions here. One's BA10, and oh, I forget the other one. Um, and they get a 60% success rating. Now, these are not real-time predictions, of course. What they do is they see how people act, and they look back at the data. They look at trial after trial and see where the strongest correlations are. And there's a 60% correlation when you take data from these two regions with the, um, with the button choice. Uh, I believe that. I mean, I believe they're getting 60%. But I also believe that there's a, a source for that, and that is that 7 to 10 seconds in advance, people are already slightly disposed toward one or the other button, partly because they're keeping track, they don't want to fall into patterns. Um, we have automatic tie-breaking mechanisms in our brain that work all the time. So my peanuts example, when I go to the supermarket, I just reach out and pick one, uh, there's an automatic tie-breaking mechanism that does it. Now, if somebody were to ask me, um, well, look, what I want you to do is don't pick any peanuts right away. Wait until you feel an urge to pick this can or that can, and then... Uh, look at your wristwatch where we had the fast clock and tell me when you felt the urge, that would change everything. But under normal conditions, it's the automatic uh, tie-breaking mechanisms that are doing it. And you could think of it this way, you know, they're sort of trying to work in, in the blood flow experiment too, and they are, they are working, uh, but they're not allowed to go all the way through. Last question. Oh, better make it count. <laughs> Um, a lot of the, que the um, experiments that you mentioned have sort of binary outcomes, like either flick your wrist or don't, or press one button or the other one. Yeah. Um, but what about experiments? Would it be possible to measure experiments with more involved decisions, like which book would you like to read, or of these bags of peanuts, which one would you like? Yeah, we, we could do more. You know, one thing I think it would be interesting to do. Now remember with the EEG you have to do it at least 40 times to get data you can use. So we can't just have people making one choice. They have to be choosing again and again. But we could do an experiment where um, it's the left button or the right button and it's, we could tell them it's a kind of selfishness experiment. And each time they press a button, a certain amount of money, it could be like a quarter goes to charity or a quarter goes to themselves. Um, we could do a study like that, tell them what we're really interested in is how greedy they are, you know, something like that. And what we want to see is whether you get different kinds of brain readings depending on which button they're going to press. So in other words, we take away the, the random picking and we substitute for it something more real. Uh, this is a doable kind of thing. We, we actually started on a project with the epilepsy patients like this, but it hasn't been completed yet, so we'll have some data in a while. Is that what you were interested in, that kind of thing? Um, I was thinking, well, this is rooted in a personal struggle of mine before I came here because I didn't, I didn't plan out which book to read on the bus. And so I had to get going and I catch her in the rye or... Free. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I was, I was just, um, I was thinking about like high pressure situations where you just kind of have to choose and you have to kind of forego free will and just trust your psychological predetermination that you just got to pick a book. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So it's not really random picking. You're going with your own true self or something like that. Well, that could be free, too. I wonder what kind of readings. You know, it's hard to stage experiments like that, though. But. I'm willing to give you a subject okay. if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Let's give Dr. Mewe a hand. Thank you. Thanks. You know, we had something happen this evening that's never happened in Lucemore Auditorium. We made a little history. Uh, did you notice because of the intellectual firepower on stage that the lights went out? I bet we blew a fuse. So I think because of that, 
because of that, you deserve a token of appreciation from <laughs> the philosophy department and the Hallenstein Center. Thank you so All much. All right, thank you. <laughs> That's funny. One last thing before we adjourn, if you want to continue this very engaging conversation with Professor Maley, you, you certainly can tomorrow morning at 1030 out in Allendale in the Mary Adama Pew uh, Library there in the Commons. You go downstairs, there's a Commons area, and that's where we're going to continue the conversation. You're going to have a great seminar opportunity. So we hope to see you tomorrow, 1030 in Allendale. Thank you so much. <laughs>